Right, so good, evening, good, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for giving up your Leicester City Sheffield United to <laughs> join us tonight for the uh, Alec Bradley Herf, and we're delighted that we have Alec and Bradley. So not one, but two for the price of one. So I'd like to thank Paul at uh, Seagars and Tourmas for giving us the, the stage. Uh, Anthony for the work he's done in the background with the videos and for what he's about to do with this video <laughs> and to the guys up in Liverpool for joining us uh, good to see another Scotsman in the room um, up there so I will understand what he says you may not understand me so as I say tonight we've got the, the two brothers Alec and Bradley all the way from Miami is that a good start? I got the right place <laughs> so, what's the normal practice when we do these? Is first of all, if you could just introduce the the sampler pack that everybody has purchased to join us. Okay. The, the two black markets and the, the lineage. So yeah. So first, uh, I'll start off with the original black market, uh, which is one of our most popular cigars around the world. Uh, in terms of the the blend information, uh, you have a dark. Nicaraguan wrapper uh, on it and for the binder a Sumatran binder from uh, Indonesia and the fillers are from Panama and Honduras So you're gonna get a pretty flavorful smoke. It's gonna give you some sweetness some pepper uh, earthiness um, So you're gonna get and it's probably uh, it's medium strength So you're gonna get a really nice balanced flavorful cigar that you can enjoy uh, at any time uh, and then next we have the Black Market Esteli, which is the second iteration of the original Black Market. Um, so the uh, Esteli is in Nicaragua, so you're going to get all Nicaraguan uh, tobacco all the way through from the from the fillers to the binder uh, and the wrapper. And it's going to be a pretty similar experience to the Black Market, but you're going to get more sweetness and woody notes from it. So it's you'll it'll hit some uh, some of the same parts of your palate but the flavor is going to be much different. And then last, uh, we have the cigar that Anthony did an awesome review on, the, uh, the Lineage. Um, and he hit uh, the nail on the head on his review. Uh, some sweetness, some tartness, uh, as well as woody and, and nutty notes. Um, that's what I usually get from this cigar. And uh, it's one of my all-time favorites, my go-tos, because of the reason it was made being... Um, for when Alec and I were both of smoking age and because I'm the youngest, it's really when I was of smoking age, uh, when I turned 18. So those are, uh, the three cigars that you have in your sampler. And, and there was me thinking the, the lineage has been out for longer than a year, Bradley. <laughs> 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 okay. Right. What we'll do guys, if you might, don't mind, is we're going to start with a video called this is Alec Bradley. So if we start with that, it will paint a picture of what to experience for the rest of the evening. So over to the video technician. Who sound, Alan? But over the last 18 years, we've gained respect by many and have been told of our success. But we definitely can't take all the credit. We've had opportunity, a country that allows us to do what we love, freedom in our creativity, with all that we need right at our fingertips. Go anywhere, do anything, there are no limits. The product, God-given leaf that fills fields all over this earth. All we have to do is harvest it. The culture we get to experience, the communities we get to support. Roll, cut, light, enjoy. The people, this is for them. Vice, Tempest, Black Market, New York, Fine and Rare, Mundial, 
Little did we know the impact each cigar would make. It becomes who they are. Everyone has the potential to make something great. If they have the opportunity, paired with good product and great people. But you can't do it for the success or the fame. It's crucial to have a strong foundation of honesty, passion, and humility, ensuring that everyone is treated the way they deserve to be treated, giving more than we take and keeping our eyes on our goal. Always look true to who you really are. And that, that's what really makes the difference. You're not living unless you live true. Very good. Very good indeed. You've lost a bit of weight, Bradley and Alex, since you filmed that, I noticed. <laughs> so what I'd like to do, guys, is I know you probably, Alan. Well, uh, maybe. Since um, your dad started in the business, 1996, and you've probably been asked this a million times. So could you take us back to the very, very beginning and talk about the Reuben history and I'd like to know what kind of ages you were at the time. And I'd also like to know what it feels like to wear the name of the company on your, on your the badge of honor, basically, Alec and Bradley. I, I know what my company would be called for my children. And I think Alec Bradley works better. Yeah. Well, so my, my dad likes away. to say that he, my dad likes to say that he bought a company named Alec Bradley and then named us after it. <laughs> um, but what ha the truth behind it is, obviously, he named it after me and my brother in the corner, Bradley. Um, but going back to 1996 and just a little bit before that time, my father was in the uh, nuts, bolts, and screws business before this with his father. And uh, he ended up taking over that company, selling it, and kind of had no clue what he wanted to do afterwards. And one of his, one of the guys he worked with said, well, you smoke a cigar from 7 a.m. when you get here till 7 p.m. when you leave. Why don't you get in the cigar business? So he thought about it and went to his local tobacconist and said, is there a trade show or anything for the cigar business? And he said, yeah, there's one coming up in a couple months. Why don't you come with me? And he went to the trade show with him, walked in and fell in love immediately from, from what he said. And um, you also asked what ages we were when we when he started the company in 1996. I was four and Bradley was one. So we grew up around this industry. Um, obviously, both fell in love with it. Both love cigars and tobacco and all the all the passion behind it. Am I up? Up. Oh. Well, you can add. You carry okay. on. Well, you, you also kind of added uh, in your question what it's like to, to have, you know, our names to be on the company. Uh, and, you know, growing up, it, there was a lot of, of pride um, and just the fact that my father, our father decided to name it after us and people kind of knew who we were just because. Uh, but now working for him, it definitely comes with a lot of nerves um, because there's a lot more people looking at us. Uh, to make sure that we're doing a good job. And that goes from the consumer and, and our distributors and retailers to everyone that works for uh, for Alec Bradley. Everyone kind of keeps an eye on us to make sure we're, uh, you know, doing our part and that our father treats us uh, just like everyone else in the company and that we're not getting, uh, getting you know, uh, you know, treated uh, better than anyone else. So uh, definitely comes with I think it's the opposite. <laughs> Yeah, do you find you get treated differently by people in the industry who are, you know, because you've grown up, I don't know what your ages are now, but you, you, I would say 22 and 27, <laughs> you know. Close. I'm 28 and Brad's 25. Very right, close okay. So you're, you're young guys. and So when you guys go to the trade show and you see all the, the greats of the industry and stuff like that, they treat you well? Brad, you or, do you, or do you feel under pressure that you have to you know, perform kind of thing for them? I would say it's different from person to person. Um, at this point, you know, most people uh, will uh, greet us with open arms and we've created that relationship now. But 
I think uh, Alec would agree with me on this, that when we, when I first started, uh, not everyone would, would give me uh, any attention or, or any sort of time to talk to them. Um, but now that we've both been doing uh, our own thing and working and coming out with our own releases, uh, you know, some of the greats uh, seem to, you know, want to talk to us a little bit more and speak with us. So it differs from person to person. And, and within Alec Bradley, do you, you've obviously got your own specific roles that you have to do, other than, you know, blending is only part of the job, I guess. Um, yeah, great our, to blend for 52 weeks of the year. But, yeah, yeah. That'd be, that would be great. Um, our roles are ever-changing. It's always, you know, more responsibility, something different, and it kind of has allowed us to find where we belong within the company, which is really nice. Um, but from day to day, we could, you know, they might need – help packing boxes in the warehouse. We could be blending, we could be doing a whiskey pairing, um, you know, or traveling on the road supporting uh, our reps or international. I mean, every day it's, it's something a little bit different. Mm, absolutely. So going back to your dad and how he got involved in the cigar industry, there's some fantastic stories about how he experimented, is that the right word, uh, with innovations, which some were I'm not sure they were more successful than others, but he spent three or four years doing quite a bit of innovation. So can you explain some of these crazy things he tried to do? Yeah. Like I heard about a, a Toblerone, a triangular style cigar and things <laughs> like that. So in the cigar industry, things have been done the same way for you know hundreds of years when it comes to rolling, rolling cigars. So there's not a ton of innovation within this industry. But um, he always wanted to push the envelope and try something a little bit different. So that triangle uh, shaped cigar that you talked about was the um, the trilogy, and that was a triangle press cigar, and was definitely something that was very different for the time. That's no longer around, but it was definitely one of the things that got him noticed. As well as when he came out with Max, um, it was all larger ring gauge cigars when there weren't really large ring gauge cigars at the time, and each cigar retailed for the same price. So. It, that was definitely something that was a little bit different, whether it was a Corona or a Churchill, they were all the same price at retail. And then I guess a little more recently stuff like the, um, the Nicopiro uh, diamond is a diamond shaped cigar, which is, I don't believe there's anyone else in the market that has that. Well, yeah, I think you're right. Not that I'm aware of, Yeah. but uh, I was just trying to visualize smoking a triangular cigar and thinking what it would be like and uh, at least it wouldn't roll off the table that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly where that idea came from so the cigar <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't roll off his desk mm -hmm. oh wow so when you were young guys and i guess your dad's coming home he's working long hours and trying to get the business established <laughs> you, you probably saw him bedtime and breakfast and stuff like that yeah, absolutely. What, what age were you guys when you first had a cigar? Don't say four and one. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, I was <laughs> I, I was eighteen. Brad, how old were you when you had your first cigar? Uh, I was eighteen. Uh, our father, he he really wasn't uh, very strict growing up. He always explained things to us as to why we should or shouldn't do something. Um, so it was always reason with him. And uh, as Alec and I got older, our us wanting to have a cigar. Uh, you know, at 16 and 17, we definitely wanted to because we were around it more. And, um, you know, we, we saw how important it was to him. But he kept saying, that's not going to happen. My my boys will not have a cigar before uh, they're 18 because it would look bad on him being a cigar owner to have his children smoking before the legal age. So um, while our father gave us a lot of leeway uh, throughout the years, that was something that he was very um, strict on. And uh, I, I've, Alec and I know our father well enough when he says, don't do something, you don't do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I'd imagine you guys were popular, the, what you call the proms and stuff like that with your case of humidor, your humidor full of cigars, yeah? Oh, absolutely. Even with uh, our teachers, for the ones that smoked and knew the company, they, uh, they loved it. So that was always good. So that's how you got your grades. Exactly. So we don't tell people that, but... Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't worry, nobody will watch the video, so you're all right. <laughs> so within the business, working with your dad now, personally, I couldn't work with my dad. Uh, not 
I, I think we would have struggled. How how do you cope? Is it like uh, what what, what, do, what do you call him at work? Um, it, I either say dad or Alan, just depending on the situation, or if I'm trying to get his attention. Sometimes he doesn't respond to dad, so I'll throw Alan out there to get his attention. Okay, so is there like a level of words that you use which you want his attention more than other times? Oh yeah, definitely. Alan is definitely what I want is when I need his attention, like when I'm trying when I'm when I'm trying to reach him and he's not paying attention. Right. But um, and, working working with your father and, and brother with you know within the same business is is definitely not easy. But at the same time, I get to spend the day with my father and my brother every single day, which is absolutely amazing. And I mean, I really wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. What would, what might be quite interesting, the guys that are in the room, is if you want to type in if you've got a brother or a sister or whatever, what your company would be called. <laughs> we could also, I won't trademark any of them, I honest, <laughs> I promise. But I, I guess your dad's giving you the freedom now to start your own blending process and um, your own range of cigars, like the yeah. Blind Face. Or how, how how does that happen? Because I guess um, you just go off and blend a load of tobacco together and go, I've got a cigar. Oh, it's not as easy as that, is it? No. So, no. Brad, it's, do you want to tell the story of how of how uh, that whole process came to be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it basically started uh, not too long after I started working, uh, and going back to to the the early ages before I could smoke, I always thought it'd be cool to come out with my own cigar. Um, you know, I see my father doing it all the time, and I remember seeing my father work on on Photoshop and Illustrator, trying to create his own artwork and. Um, you know, he, he wasn't necessarily the best at it, but he worked at it just so we can come up with ideas. And, uh, so a few months into me working, I went to Alec and said, man, how cool would it be to come out with our own cigar? And Alec was like, that's awesome. Why do, we should definitely be doing this. And we brought the idea to our father and he was like, that's an awesome idea. Like, I can't wait, blah, blah, blah. He was all for it. And Alec and I were kind of like, well, this is this is our project. This is for us. And um, so he, he respected that. And something our father always told us was, you can be Alan Rubin's sons or you can be Alec and Bradley. And <clears throat> that was part of what gave us the motivation to come out with our own products is we want people to know us, to know what cigars we enjoy, what, what artwork we like, what the packaging is, and kind of get a feeling for who we are. Um, not just, uh, you know, who my father is and what he created. And being that a lot of people think that our father is Alec Bradley, we thought that this would be a, a nice little idea, even though not everyone's going to pick up on it, that having Alec and Bradley on the bands, some people might say, well, I thought the company was called Alec Bradley. Like, let me do some research, look it up, and find out that the, cigar, that the company is named after you know, our, after Alec and myself and learn a little bit more about the company and more about us. So what was the first blend that you guys came out with on your own? So the first one was Blind Faith, uh, which you just mentioned. Um, you know, we really want a cigar that would grab people's attention, whether they enjoyed it or not. Um, we didn't want a cigar that people would say, well, yeah, I kind of like it. It's okay. I would rather someone say, man, I really love this cigar or I really hate this cigar. Uh, nothing in between was, was the goal. And, uh, you know, cool enough, we just got a, the number three cigar on Cigar Journal, which, I mean, I was shocked. I didn't think that was a, a possibility. So it was, it was really cool to, to have people notice uh, our first blend, uh, Blind Faith, and the reason for that name, because everyone that is buying, selling the cigar, smoking the cigar, our father needed to have blind faith in us because this is our first shot. This isn't, it has nothing to do with our father. It was solely Alec and I coming up with the cigar, the packaging, the marketing and everything in between. And, and everyone needed to have that blind faith in us. Wow. That's really good. That's a good story. And in terms of the profile of the people who are buying blind faith, do you find that they're more, of your kind of age group because they're associating with yourself uh, and Alec? 
Um, I don't um, think they're necessarily uh, our age group. I think that more people that are buying it are looking for a specific profile of cigar because this really is uh, medium full to full in terms okay. of profile. It has a um, has a lot of uh, Lijeros and Maduros within the filler. It's a lot, it's all Honduran and Nicaraguan, so it really is a profile based cigar in my opinion, and that goes back to what Bradley said, where he kind of we kind of wanted people to either love it or hate it. So being medium full to full, I think that we kind of hit the nail on the head with what we were going for. Well, superb. And your follow-up brand? Our uh, follow-up brand was, uh, is called Gatekeeper. And uh, we decided to make that in the Dominican Republic because Alec Bradley doesn't make anything in the Dominican Republic. Mm-hmm. So we partnered up with uh, the legendary Ernesto Perez Cadillo. Yeah. We, uh, you know, wanted to work with someone who, who has the, you know, the knowledge that we definitely don't have. Uh, I think he's been doing this longer than Alec and I have been alive combined. And so, you know, learn from a different perspective than our father and our vice president, Ralph, and uh, see what else he can kind of give to us that uh, maybe they, they see differently. And uh, the brand is really an homage to Ernesto. Um, for everything that he's done in the industry, but also with what comes with making this brand gatekeeper is that we saw Ernesto as the gatekeeper. You know, I was very afraid of Ernesto when I first saw him. I thought he was a very um, intimidating looking person, uh, but he's really, (laughs) really nice actually and and, uh, treated us just like everyone else. And I thought that after we make the cigar, that, that Ernesto would open the gates for us. And uh, so I thought it was a cool way to pay homage to Ernesto and everything he's done in this industry. And of course, you both will talk about the number one cigar in the world, which is in every video and every conversation ever probably in your whole life. But you have that in common with uh, Ernesto as well. So you've gone for you've gone for the best there. Absolutely. And, and then the, the latest project is... So the latest project uh, I have right here is uh, it's called Kintsugi. Kintsugi. It's, uh, Kintsugi. It's based off of a, uh, a Japanese art form of piecing back broken pottery, so bowls and plates with gold lacquer. So when you have the, the final piece after it's been broken again, you see the gold cracks. And uh, the deeper meaning behind it is that there's beauty in the imperfections. Uh, kind of, you know, a little meaning on life. And, and I just thought that was beautiful itself. And I thought it segued pretty nicely to the cigar industry and, and what we've been seeing over here with our FDA regulation, um, as well as, uh, you know, the trade show being a big point and, and some companies leaving this uh, our trade show over here. And so we had this very fragmented industry. And uh, I was, Alec and I were talking, you know, how do we bring how do you bring the industry together? You know, what's the gold lacquer? And you would think that it is the cigar. It's what we all love and enjoy. But with this worldwide pandemic, it's been that that's really brought us together to come on a virtual hearth like we are right now and do virtual events with people across the world. Um, you know, people that are in our, our country and, and on a bunch of different platforms, we're all we're all on the same level and we're all speaking the same language. And, um, you know, that's really the gold lacquer that's brought this whole industry together during this tough time or is, is this, this virtual event. Very good. When do you plan to release uh, the cigar, Bradley? Uh, Alec, I think we're, we talked about September, we're hoping. Yeah, so this cigar was supposed to be released, obviously, a couple months ago. But with, you know, COVID, it slowed down the process and we actually made some changes to it during this, you know, during everything going on. And it, it should be launching in September. Okay. That's our goal. Okay. No, well, very good. No, that's brilliant. What I'd like to do is just show another wee video, which shows from, uh, it's very relevant to what we've been doing so far, one generation to the other. Mm-hmm. So if the video master is around. Don't put that porn one on that you did the other night by accident. Oh, good evening. I didn't, didn't see you. Well, it's not Shh. Jen. Don't tell anyone. 
Well, don't make the same mistake again, you know, although we did have record <laughs> viewers, record amounts of people online. Alec, Alec Bradley does Brighton. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. We're sorted. <laughs> right. Alan, are you? It's not working, Scott. Keep talking. Ah. I'll let you yeah. know. <laughs> okay. Well, we might come back to that later. I've, I've right. practiced this about 25 times. Typical. Well. <laughs> Honestly, Alan Graham, Alan Graham, Graham Allen, surely you can get this right. <laughs> We're launching that next week, the Graham Allen cigar. <laughs> yeah, you've got the Mitchell auction. Yeah? Wait, wait, sorry. Yes, what? You're talking what? to me or Mitchell? I am. Hello. It's Mitchell Orchard. Sorry. Mitchell, you've got Bradley and Alec in the room. Hey, Mitchell. Alec Bradley. I can see everybody. Oh, hello. Oh, there we are. I, yeah, I don't think we met um, at any of the shows. I don't know why. Maybe your father kept you tucked away. Um, <laughs> you know, I, just, I was just going to ask you, what's it really like? Give us the skinny, give us some, some dirt on your dad. Um, you know, what's it really like working with him? And I asked from the standpoint of a guy who um, also worked with my father for many years in business. And uh, I remember even when I was about, I don't know, 55 which is now my father still talks to me like I'm a little boy which is really funny and I say to him dad you know I'm 55 I'm successful in business for many many years and we were in business together you're talking to me like I'm a 12 year old and he just says to me well to me you still are a 12 year old which doesn't really help at all but it's kind of funny I was just wondering got any dirt you can dish on your dad at all anything we can have over him well Mitchell first off it's great to meet you <laughs> finally you. um yeah, I mean, first off, my dad is a tough but fair businessman and working for him is definitely not the easiest sometimes just because he holds Bradley and I to a higher standard. Um, and we try to live up to that. So not always easy. Um, there's nothing really all that negative about about working for him. Really, it's um, the only thing that that's that's a little bit that can be a little bit tough is uh, he likes to have his final stamp of approval on everything. And completely understand why he's done this for you know 20 plus years at this point and he's done a great job at it so i don't think he's uh willing to let us make uh make as big of mistakes as we probably could at this point so but there's, yeah there's there's really not anything bad about working for him every we enjoy every single day here we all get along extremely well luckily otherwise i don't know if we'd be able to do this yes so you, have a, you have a different take on it no, I was just going to say, if you get any problems with your dad, you just let me know and I'll straighten things out. No problem. I appreciate that because I will make that call. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mitchell. We appreciate, we appreciate the help. I, I didn't say it, was, it comes free, the help. It comes at a charge. But, you <laughs> whoa, know, whoa, you, did, you didn't say that up front. You didn't say that up front. <laughs> well, well, we've got Mitchell in the conversation here. We, we, let's talk about the cigars you produce for him. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. I, as, the, as the guy in the middle... It's my job to bring everyone together and, you know, Mitch Mitchell's a very demanding person. He's got his very specific what he's looking for. My wife says the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so I've got Mitchell on one side being, you know, very specific about what he's looking for. These are the sizes, these are the names, this is the blend, this is the, the profile of Smoker. We've got yourself on the Alec Bradley side, you've got your father who's very precise. Very, so... What was the story internally? Because is it something Alec Bradley do? do I mean, do you make a lot of third party for other people, or was this a kind of unique it's, project? It, it's we, we do make some, but it's not very often. We're very particular about who we work with, and it needs to be the right person at the right time. And it, not just that, but we're not going to put our you know our stamp on something unless the blend is absolutely spectacular. And what we came up with, Mitchell, I think, is absolutely wonderful. I would agree. And in fact, the process um, of the final blend looks wonderful as well, because uh, you boys weren't around then. I mean, you may have been in the business, but you weren't at the meeting um, yeah. when Ronnie, my partner, who's over there, and I went to your offices and we had a bit of a scotch sampling, just a little taster with George, oh, yes. um, your dad and Ralph, I believe it was uh, the five of us. And we went through a load of different blend samples, but the Rice's one literally blew us away. Rod and I said, we've never tasted such a sweet blend of tobacco, and what the hell is it? Um, 
and George really gave us a lot of details about it. So did Ralph. And we were like, this is it. This is the absolute winner. And I still believe that. And it's a, it's a very important line for us, um, which is an ongoing line. And we've, of course, done the line extensions this year as well, mm-hmm. um, which are becoming very popular as well. Uh, it's just an excellent cigar. It's an excellent blend. That Rice's Factory is something special. There's a bit of magic going on there. And I'd, I'd love to visit it one day, but at least I get to smoke the cigars that uh, you kindly make for us there. So yeah, well, it was a fun. That was a fun time choosing that blend. I can tell you. Well, the first thing is I'm extremely upset that I missed that blending session be- between smoking the cigars and drinking the whiskey. I'm sure we would have had a great time. Yeah, but we didn't want to share it with you guys. You're too young. Hey, I'll I'll bring my own. That's that's fine. I always, I always <laughs> got a bottle around. <laughs> <laughs> and the second how, how, is I know the blend and I've smoked the blend. So that, that sweetness that you're talking about from the Honduran, uh, from the Honduran and Nicaraguan tobacco, I mean, I completely get why you fell in love with that blend. Well, that's actually the epitome of what I'm looking for, for my auction selection series of cigars. It's a very personal thing for me because I don't smoke strong cigars because I smoke cigars from morning till night, more or less every day of the week. So I'm looking for lots of flavor, volumes of flavor, lots of complexity, flavor development, and I'm not looking for kick-ass strength, as our American brothers would say, because I don't want to knock my palate out because I smoke so much. So when I experienced the Rice's blend, I was like, this is exactly it. There is very little strength in that blend. You know, it's, it's a very pronounced flavor. There are, there's a kaleidoscope of flavors, but there's no strength to knock you out at all. So I thought, whoa, that is exactly dead on. And that's what I know our customers like in the UK. You know, a lot of people talk about they like a strong cigar, you know, they like a full-bodied cigar. But I, I've always believed, and I'm probably right because I'm the biggest cigar specialist in the UK, um, I've, I've always believed that customers are actually looking for flavor, not strength. And I think I've proven that with the amount of cigars we actually sell. Um, and when we actually do have particularly strong cigars, they have a far smaller following and loyalty than full flavored cigars. So I absolutely love what you just said, especially because at Alec Bradley, we always try to be flavor forward. That's always our first thing. Strength kind of plays a second role to flavor and no matter what we blend, even with the blind faith that we say is more on the, meat, on the full side, our goal was to always have the flavor first. Because as you add strength to a cigar, you always lose flavor. Absolutely. So we were looking, we were looking for that happy medium on blind faith with flavor and strength, which is a very tough balance balancing act. And I completely, completely understand why. I mean, I've smoked your blends. I mean, it's it's fantastic. So I complete, I completely understand the direction you were going down. Well, not only did you produce a fabulous cigar, you produced fabulous packaging presentation for us. Um, amazing. I mean, talk about 10 out of 10. Couldn't criticize a, a dot or a comma on it. Absolutely fantastic. So, you know, really did a, a great job from start to finish. Scott had a small part to play in it. He got on my nerves <laughs> as usual, but, you know, that's uh, kind of normal. But, yes, Scott, uh, you did a good job overall. Not bad at all. Got to try a bit harder next time. But, <laughs> nah, okay. Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm interested if you can remember how you got the names the Shorty, Skinny and Chubby. Uh, I think I've got Ron to blame for that because he's the creative director in the company. I think um, he chose them as usual. Yeah. No, they were great names and it was a good project. And for me personally, it was one of the first ones. We'd worked with one before, so that was the, the second one. But this is the Meteor one because you got into the the small four and the three packs and the Calebra, which um, is the only one in our warehouse, which is pretty funky. And I think if, if I'm correct, it's the only one Alec Bradley actually makes. Is that true? That is I correct. It's the only Calebra we, we make. Oh, there you right. go. So, so that was a exclusive. So of course, when we spoke to Ralph and said, this is what Mitchell wants, he's like, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know? And so it was a big challenge for them to make those cigars. So, I actually, I actually just realized I did smoke the Calabra here when the samples came in, and it was fantastic. Me too. I just, re- I just remember that. That's hilarious. I, I find the Calabra a very interesting um, cigar because, as you know, when you're when you're adjusting the blend for size and shape, it's very difficult to get the balance. So you still got a similar or the same flavor expression, and you know because of the shape of the Calabras 
it's double difficult. You know, you're, you're scaling down to such an extent that you're taking leaves out to actually try and balance it. I, I can't imagine how difficult that is. I wouldn't have liked to have blended that my, myself. And I think, you know, whoever's done it over there has really done a very, very good job because, you know, different size cigars, sure, they're going to taste similar. You can't get them to taste identical. I remember having this conversation with Henke Kellner and he was describing how unbelievably difficult it is to scale up or down and retain that flavour characteristic. And I would have thought it's even that much more difficult on a funky size like Calabras, but you, you'd certainly nailed it. So well done, whoever was well, the, responsible. The nice thing about, about the wrapper on that, it's a Trojas under and wrapper which just the flavor carries carries over so well so when you are scaling up or down it does make it a bit easier and i like i said i did smoke it and i thought it was absolutely wonderful i actually wasn't even told what it was at the time but now that i realize absolutely phenomenal cigar and and a fun size as well and great packaging absolutely great so i think that was down to ralph wasn't it he he worked yeah out yeah there. ralph ralph was there Ralph was the man. I just hope to God you guys didn't try to smoke all three at the same time, huh? <laughs> you don't know what I did. Uh, I've had many customers um, emailing me that there was a problem with the cigar and sending me photos that they've lit all three at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Funny. So, so, guys, Honduras is your kind of capital for your cigar making. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, was the, what was the thinking there? Because I guess in... in the days when your dad and Ralph were thinking about where to produce. Nicaragua was, was becoming hotter and hotter, but you chose Honduras. So back then, I think that Alec Bradley was making a lot in the Dominican Republic and in Nicaragua. And then um, my father became friendly with the owners of Rices Cubanas, started producing a couple cigars there, and the relationship just built after that. And... Uh, we were given a lot of attention at the factory, which is very nice. And I believe at this point we make up over 85% of their production. So yeah, absolutely love working with that factory. It's always, it's always a ton of fun going down there and spending time with them and blending sessions. It's, it's, it's always nice. Very good. Very good. So talking about individual brands, I want to talk about black market. When we launched uh, Ali Bradley into the UK 2012, I think it was, we started with Black Market and Prinsado. So that was our opening gambit, which was a pretty safe bet. Mm, I'm a yeah. Scotsman, so we don't take too many risks. <laughs> and, um, but the Black Market itself is uh, just an amazing uh, cigar, but it's also fantastic packaging. Yeah. And when people talk about the difference between different companies, innovation and packaging and things like that, I automatically think of the black market. And I, and I know people buy empty boxes of cigars as trinket boxes. I think the black market is one of the most sought after empty boxes, which is crazy, but it's true. So mm. tell us a little bit about black market and the design and who came up with this, this great idea. Yeah. So that was, uh, our, our father's baby. Um, you know, something that we've learned along the way from just watching him is that a cigar isn't just a cigar and that the packaging is just as important because it needs to match the cigar. You may have a cigar with really dark packaging. It might be all black. Um, and then you get, you know, a Connecticut that is really light and it just doesn't match. So my father loved uh, the name Black Market and thought, you know, what would a cigar you know, falling off the back of a truck in a crate look like, and he wanted to to get that exact uh, exact packaging. And uh, I know that some some people have even complained saying that they don't like the black market box as a retailer because stacking it can be tough. But in terms of the whole packaging coming together, you need that. You need that whole cohesive look because it's what attracts people to it. And and that rough uh, that rough wood and rough uh, you know big foot band it, it brings everything together. And when you smoke it, you see why the packaging looks like that because it all it all comes together and, and you get the, the experience of the cigar that goes along with that crate with that, you know, big foot wrapper on it and a uh, big foot band and it, it just all works. Yeah. Yeah. A little I bit mean, the biggest compliment that. you can have is that people have tried to copy you. That's true. It has been Absolutely. copied. A little bit more on that story is um, with for Black Market. When my dad was down at the factories with Ralph, they were blending cigars. 
and they weren't there working on black market my dad thought of the name he loved the name but they were they were working on a different project and they smoke they were smoking this blend and my dad said ralph this is this is black market this is the one and he said we're not even here blending for black market he goes i don't care this cigar is telling me it's black market this is what it is and we got to move forward with it immediately so he went back to the hotel that night and just started sending pictures of crates and you know things falling off of a truck and different images to the graphic designer and he started working on it immediately and black market was almost completed within i think the packaging within a few weeks just because he had such a vision for it once he smoked the cigar well has the name caused you any problems anywhere no not not that no. i've seen no not, we not we we had, we had a story about a retailer somewhere in the uk who uh Refused to stock it because <laughs> we don't stock black market cigars. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the first I'm hearing. That's the that's the UK for you. <laughs> but um, so I want to ask you about fine and rare, and um, and I, and I think I'm going to be upset this year because we've collected the fine and rare every year, and I love the fact that you change the vitola every year. I love what you do with the 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 the, the band. You get all the signatures of the people making it. You number them. Um, where did that idea come from? And the 10 different tobaccos. Are you going to share with us where they're from? No? Um, I don't I, think Alex and I, I don't think we know where they're from. There's, there's yeah, too that's hi highly confidential information that we're not even privy to. There's too many to count. But, um, you know, Find and Rare came out uh, coming on 10 years ago. Um, and I, you know, way before my time, but from what I heard, my, my father, uh, like you said, Scott, all about being innovative and, and trying something new and different. And well, most cigars probably have about five or six different tobaccos, uh, in it, our father wanted to, to be innovative, try something different and do 10 different tobaccos, create something special, a unique experience and making sure that the cigars are, are always amazing by only having the two best rollers in the factory roll them. Um, and as they've, you know, each release comes out, um, my father gives it a really unique uh, name and code that uh, only he knows. And it has some sort of, uh, you know, special meaning behind it, but he doesn't always like to reveal it. And uh, it's our, you know, our, our expensive premium product in, in trying to give the consumer such a great experience that they can only get, uh, um, once a year. So, uh, last year's, uh, fine and rare was dedicated to, uh, our, our late grandfather, uh, who passed away about two years ago. And, uh, he used to come and work in the office every day. He was the first person here. Uh, if Alec or I were late, it wasn't a good morning. It was a good afternoon. Um, we're talking about two minutes late. Yeah. It was good afternoon. Know. Good afternoon. You know, if we're not, if he's there on time, we should be there on time. And uh, so that was probably the most special fun release we've had to date, um, just dedicated to someone that uh, was so important to us, uh, who my father worked along with, uh, you know, before he started out, Bradley, who worked here for, for years and years as well, um, just a, a part of the Alec Bradley family. So um, if you haven't uh, gotten a chance to try that one, I think it's the best fun and rare release we've ever had. I've tried every year to keep one by for myself. I think I missed a year. Um, I think I sold it to Mitchell instead, which, uh, but, and, and I think it's great because in what I call the new world arena, we're still looking for collector pieces. Mm -hmm. Like you have the vintage with the Cuban and whatever, but in new world, we don't have the age and the heritage um, in the same way. So to me, the fine and rare is something that over time, it's going to be uh, a pretty valuable cigar. Well, I hope so because I've got <laughs> I've bought one for myself every year. Uh, the first year that we came out with Fine and Rare, I had to go buy them at, at, at a store because they all shipped immediately and I was not living down down here by my parents and by the factory or by the uh, office. So I had, I had to go and buy my first Fine and Rare that I ever tried. Wow. And of course, this year you're doing something a wee bit different with a box of 25, but you're limiting it from what I understand. Um, 
which means it's going to be a pretty tight struggle to get hands on any. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so it is to, it's uh, each release that we've done, five cigars of each in the box. So it is kind of an homage to the, from, to, from the beginning till now on everything that we've come up with with Fine and Rare. Yeah. Well, I keep em emailing Ralph saying, how many can I get? And he's refusing to open my emails. So you've probably sold them all already, you buggers. So no, um, definitely, must, definitely not yet. You must have sent your emails to uh, to a spam box, uh, Scott. I must have oh, that. I've got new contacts now eh? after tonight. <laughs> Thank you. So Texas Lanceros. We have in London in St. James the there's a little plaque on St. James's Street which uh, commemorates the I don't know the, the state of Texas, would you believe, in London. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I remember George Souza, his first visit over, we happened to be walking down the famous cigar street there and we found the plaque by accident. And of course, George, we spent about an hour <laughs> getting pictures of George with his, you know, to, to send back home. So the story of the 7x70 Texas Lanceros, our first boxes arrived in boxes of 50. It was like a milk crate. Yeah, <laughs> it was absolutely yeah. enormous. And it actually caused our office to stop working for the girls to come down and look at what the hell is this? And when we tried to display it at a trade show, we couldn't get the shelf above it to go high enough to open the box. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just brilliant. But it sells well. Yeah, yeah. people are smoking larger ring gauges and um, Texas Lancero is a little bit tongue-in-cheek in terms of, uh, you know, Lanceros are generally skinny cigars, but the saying is everything's bigger in Texas, so we made a very large <laughs> Lancero. Yeah, I'm glad now you bought them in tens because I could open the box now when we do trade shows. We did that just but, for uh, you, Scott. Thank you. But I think there's a guy is uh, there's a guy in the room from Newcastle, and he actually was building a wall with them with the the fifty count boxes. Oh my God, that's great! It was incredible. Absolutely incredible. <laughs> but, uh, but that was really funny. But uh, so moving on, filthy hooligans. I think we do quite well with that in the UK for some reason. Um, the filthy hooligan. So that's a, a great idea. I remember you got into some kind of trouble at the beginning, or the, the Irish community in America weren't particularly over happy. Yeah, I, I think at the time. Uh, I don't know too much about it, but my father had received some emails or maybe some Facebook messages and uh, and some sort of Irish community was not happy with the term hooligan um, and got really mad. But it, it was really just a, you know, a small group of people. And my father was just like, I, I apologize that it offends you, but uh, you know, we're not going to change, change the name of this cigar um, because he wasn't really getting that many messages from people. And, uh, I don't think Scott, I don't think you were, uh, or, or anyone else thought it was an issue. So um, when we first came out with it, it was an all Candela wrapper. Scott, I don't know if you, if you carried those back in the day. I've, got, I've actually, I was checking my stash for the weekend, and I've actually got a bit of what, what I do is when I bring in a new cigar, I buy the first box. So I've got a box of the very first uh, Filthy Hooligans that I bought back in, I don't know, 2013? 14 or 12 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I actually opened it on Saturday, but it was still green. <laughs> yeah. Just. So, <laughs> I don't know if, if people uh, liked them as much uh, as they do now. Uh, I think a lot of people don't like that grassy candela uh, flavor so much, but once we switched it to the, to the barber pole with the same wrapper as the black market, uh, people seem to start liking it a lot more. Uh, and we've been doing that ever since. And then as of more recently, uh, two years ago, we came out with the Filthy Hooligan Shamrock, which has three wrappers on it. And we did a pretty limited amount the first run um, because we weren't sure how people would take to it. And it did extremely well. People were looking all over the place for it. Um, it was actually one of the first projects I got to help uh, work on was the artwork for that project in the box. Um, my father was like, I think it was January uh, or, or December 
And he's like, yeah, we have Filthy Hooligan coming up soon, but we want to work on this Shamrock idea with, with three rappers. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And he's like, yeah, you're going to head up uh, the artwork and the packaging and you got to get it done in a month. I'm like, great. That is really scary. But I think I can do it. And I think I got some ideas. And uh, luckily it came out pretty cool. And then uh, last year's release, because people uh, really wanted it and um, a lot of people international wanted to try it as well and be up production. And it seems like people have uh, really been enjoying it. So that was a lot of fun to work on. So well, we, uh, we brought both in uh, this year. And mm -hmm. the Shamrock sold out in like 48 hours out to the retail trade. And um, the normal Filthy Hooligan, we, we did well with because it, it's one of our most popular annual uh, limited editions. So I'm hoping you're going to do it again next year. We Absolutely. will do it again. I promise. Okay, so are you going to do them in both? Yes. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're going to do both. Don't worry. Excellent. Yeah. No, it's great. And the thing is, throughout the year, we, we, we try to get it out before St. Patrick's Day, obviously. And um, but throughout the year, we still get requests all year oh. round, which is... I, which I really is like dark. the direction that we, that we went down on the barber pole, just because when you smoke a Candela wrapper... It does have that heavy grassy note, but there's this amazing creamy note that you get from Candela wrappers that you can't really get anywhere else. So when we added the barber pole to it, it kind of cut that grassy note down, I would say over 90%, and you're left with that really creamy note that you just can't find anywhere else. So doing the barber pole, I just think was you know, a great transition on that cigar. So the next one you have to make is like a tartan. Like a what? Okay, Sorry. like a tartan. You know, okay, like we Scot can do that. Scottish no tartan. Yeah. There's your challenge. I want four, yeah, four different tobaccos on the, <laughs> yeah. There's your we challenge. Got, might not be the, that might not be the easiest. We'll tell we'll, Ralph. We could definitely give it a try. Ralph. Yeah, just, just tell Ralph. I'll buy a box, okay? <laughs> um, on the box? Yeah. So tell me, so the big, the big moment that really changed the whole world, I guess, for Alec Bradley is the Prinsado. There's only yeah. been... There's only been 18 number one cigars in the world. And in 2011, you got one of them. Yeah? Yeah. Well, uh, I think we, Alec can uh, explain a little bit on the experience. Yeah. I, I'd yeah, like to so. know what it, what it feels like to get that phone call or however they tell you. I don't know. And then what happens next? After you, you celebrate, you go, oh, shit, we don't have any cigars, I guess. So I, I was working at the office at that time. So when it was coming out, we didn't get two through, I can't remember how they released it back then. I, they may have changed it now, but we didn't get two through 25. We, we got nothing in the, in the top 24 essentially at that point. So we were like, maybe there's a chance that we get number one, but maybe not, uh, not really counting on it. And that morning, um, my dad said, let's, let's wait a little bit. Uh, we'll go in a little bit late. We'll check together to see who got number one. So I brought my laptop and I sat with my mom and dad. And uh, I think Bradley was away at school at that time. And uh, getting we got number one and we were just completely freaking out. And I, my dad almost, he was, you know, a couple of tears coming down because he never thought that that would happen in his career. And we went into the office and basically just celebrated for the first hour hour and a half and then the phones were ringing off the hook like crazy and we were sold out of all of our inventory within two to three hours i believe after that and back orders like like absolutely crazy um it definitely was an amazing experience for us and one that we hope we get to experience again one day but the odds of that you know you never know but it was just a surreal moment that I was really, really proud to be a part of and just makes, I'm sure Bradley would agree, just makes us super proud of what our dad was doing at the time and the business he was in. And I think that was part of the reason I wanted to continue within the business and just, you know, fell in love with everything cigars was that one experience. Well, but for you guys, it must've been a major headache once the dust settled in you, You've, you've had a few whiskeys and you've finished celebrating and you're, holy shit, we don't have any cigars. Because yeah. you can't just turn the tap on and make a cigar. So yeah. the next 12 months must have been one hell of a challenge for you. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, being down at the factories, trying to make sure production gets done. Um, people were, were calling every single day trying to get Prensado. And I know it's still that way with when other companies have won. Um, their phones just are going off for that for those next 12 months, just people trying to get their hands on the cigar. And people don't realize it takes time to produce cigars. You have to have the tobacco, one thing. It has to age is another. Um, you need the manpower to roll all the cigars. Uh, boxing, packaging, all of that stuff needs to kind of happen at the same time. And from the, from the day that you decide to start rolling a cigar to the day it gets into our offices, you know, could be, it's at minimum three months, but it could be way more than that. So it, it's not easy um, producing cigars on demand like that. And we definitely ran into some hiccups at that time and we overcame them. But it, it was just, it was a whirlwind for that next year. But I guess as a business that maybe took you along on a spike and because it oh, yeah. attracted people to every other cigar that you made, I guess. Mm-hmm. It was it was a ridiculous amount of growth in one year that was, yeah. and I guess insane. that's maybe what brought you into the international market more, as mm-hmm. well. People would have woken up to who you know who are these guys. Before that, you were, you know you were a named brand. People knew who Ali Bradley was. Yeah, but maybe weren't really you know should we work with this brand or whatever. Well, you you brought in like you said, black market and Prensado were the first two that you brought in. Yeah, so. It, def- it definitely uh, made some, some splash worldwide, which was, it made, a, it, it made a, a splash worldwide and it definitely helped us grow our international markets too. Yeah, I can remember your dad and Ralph and George coming over to Dortmund to do a fact-finding mission um, to work out, you know, what they were going to do internationally and to try and meet people and whatever. And when I think back, that was less than 10 years ago. You know, yeah. So, it, it, so you've like come a, a long way in that ten years from three guys, you know, walking around with a briefcase and a bag of samples, trying to find out who the right guys are to work with and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, now you've got people knocking on your door, wanting to work with you. So I'm the sure, rules are. Sure. Our father never thought that would happen. So it definitely took a lot of time and hard work. I'll say that it doesn't just happen. And you have to put up with things as well because I heard a wonderful story about um, Bradley, your first into tobacco. <laughs> oh, God. With uh, Mr. Souza. I, yeah. I, I still don't know if it's a true story or not. So, but I believe you had to share a room with George Souza for like the whole of uh, the Dortmund trade show. Is that yeah. a true story? That's a very true story. So I, I started uh, <laughs> two weeks before uh, IPCPR here in the states uh that was in june or july um so that was my first experience for for work was our trade show and then my second experience traveling for work was enter the back and being that i had just started working and then didn't decide uh or really my father decided for me that i would be going to enter the back just a few months later there were, the hotel we were staying at had no more rooms but george's room had two beds and uh and while the rooms were small and george is a big guy and the beds are even smaller uh you know we were sleeping uh, you know that far apart and uh i heavily considered uh taking taking the uh, blanket off and and going into the tub to get some sleep because george snores just so loudly and right in my face and i could feel the hot air on my neck and uh, <laughs> and so I was I, I put in my my headphones trying to drown them out. That didn't work, and I just had to wait until I was exhausted enough to fall asleep, um, only to wake up to George uh, showering before me uh, with the with the uh, with the door open, and, uh, I'm, <laughs> and I'm, I'm like I'm getting ready, and I look in the mirror is right across from the bathroom, and I look in the mirror, and all I see is George uh, George's backside. And uh, and that was my my first experience traveling with George. I hear the, I've heard training. this story more than once, and it makes me laugh every time. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. The last time, you know, George has obviously gone off to do his own thing now. Last time he was in the UK, we were at Liverpool, uh, Mitchell store, and we were doing a cigar night. In fact, we were launching the the Orchard Alec Bradley selection, 
and George had screwed up on his times. We were in Liverpool, and he suddenly announces to me, shit, my flight's tomorrow morning, not Friday morning. So instead of taking a nice drive down to London the next day to get to Heathrow and drop him off, we had to get there that night. So George is a big guy. As you, anybody who's met George, he's, he's a character and, and a half. We stopped at the service station just outside Liverpool. We'd, we'd left Mitchell's um, cigar lounge, the puffing room, about nine o'clock to drive to Heathrow Airport. And we he bought this family pack of what we call crisps mm-hmm. and, a, and like a ton bottle of Coca-Cola. And that was his dinner. And I drove down the M6 on, in um, Roadworks nearly all the way to London hearing this crunch, 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 crunch. So, Bradley, I, I, I understand. I really do. So now you guys are getting used to the Europeans and the Americans. What do you find the big difference between the, the two the two marketplaces and, and the civilized crowd that you have here tonight? Bradley <laughs> might have more insight on that than I do. Yeah, so it, it kind of goes back to what Mitchell was saying earlier um, and that he wanted a, a lighter cigar because he doesn't want to just ruin his palate with, uh, with strength and, and body. Um, and that's what I find different about international or, or European cigar smokers or, or you guys in, in the UK is that you guys like a cigar for the morning, a different cigar for the afternoon and different for the evening. So you'll go from light to uh, you know medium to full as the day goes on where american cigar smokers they want whatever their favorite cigar is if it's a a powerhouse they want it in the morning in the evening or in the afternoon and the evening and i I mean i I don't personally that's not how i always do it but um I, i see that that's a pretty big big difference between the american cigar smoker and international cigar smokers are a little bit more sophisticated in knowing what they want at what time of day with, uh, you know, their coffee or their, or their late night drink. Mm. So have you considered making different cigars for <clears throat> international and America? Cause I guess the easy option is just to make for everyone and sell everywhere. Um, you know, it's it's tough to do that because then you got to start working a little bit smaller quantities. So I don't know that it it's uh, that's feasible, but um, because you know we do have such a wide range uh, of cigars that I think we have something for every cigar smoker, and we have cig- enough cigars for people that like something light in the morning and medium in the afternoon and and full um, and strong by uh, by nighttime. So I think we already kind of hit that. Um, that wide range where people can pick up really whatever they want in whatever category and enjoy it at any time. It's not just that, (laughs) but I think that um, you never know what's going to work, right? You never know what's going to work in a certain area when you put it out. So even if it is a little bit more medium to full, like you said, you started with Pensado and Black Market. Those aren't light cigars by any means. They are on that medium, medium plus range. And they've gone over extremely well. So you never just you never exactly know what's going to work. So it's it's best to just you know put out put your best foot forward on every cigar that you come out with. And I guess you mentioned earlier about the the, the next cigar you have, which is obviously coming September, where I guess it would be now you'd be launching it in America. Um, so COVID nineteen, we've seen the the, the PCA the the International trade show cancelled. Mm-hmm. We've seen Inter to Back uh, cancelled this year. Our UK trade show has now been uh, cancelled this year. Um, so what, what are you guys doing to, to get around that and get out to the trade? What kind of things are you doing? Um, so within the States, right now we have this traveling uh, road show going on where we're doing regional trade shows throughout the United States. So I think today we have three, I think potentially three going on. Uh, Brad, do you know which three are today? I know it's Chicago. Chicago, Atlanta, and Missouri. And uh, and so we're doing um, 16 cities, a total of 27 events in about two weeks. Wow. So- Are you involved in these? uh, 
Yes. Uh, so I, I just came back from doing the Naples uh, event. So we're doing it with Rocky Patel, with Oliva and Crown Heads. Um, and so I, we just had the first event at uh, Burn in Naples, Rocky's Lounge. Um, and uh, so we're not, we're not uh, getting on any planes just to be safe uh, of COVID-19, <clears throat> trying to limit uh, people traveling on planes and have our local salespeople go to the events and, and wear their masks and, and try and keep social distancing. But as we all know, people still love to smoke their cigars. Um, so it's really just if you, uh, you know, if you want to, but it's, we're, we're trying to encourage everyone to keep their mask on and, and not smoke to try and keep everyone safe. And the other thing we've been doing, oh, I'm sorry, Scott. No, I was just going to ask how COVID's affecting the factories. The factories were in Honduras were shut down for a little while in Nicaragua. Most of them remained open, but just uh, partial capacity. And things are back open now. It definitely put us back a little bit and slowed us down. But we are expecting containers soon. And, um, you know, we were extremely fortunate that we got two giant containers in two, two days before Central America shut down. So that held us over pretty well. But our warehouse is basically empty at this point. Um, we're producing cigars at a steady pace because we don't want to rush anything. We can't rush cigars. And, um, yeah, we're just, we're just trying to take everything in stride and make sure you know the cigars that do come in are the best quality possible and make sure everyone stays safe. But I was going to say before that the, um, the other thing that we've been doing, which has been great, is these virtual hearths getting to – talk to our distributors, our retailers, and our consumers, and really get to connect in, in this way. And that we found this to be an extremely successful way to, to connect to people. Ooh. And how, how many of these are you guys doing? Oh, wow. Um, One an hour? Uh, I think since COVID-19 started, we're up to between myself, Bradley, my father, and Ralph, uh, somewhere around at least 30. Does that sound wow. right, Brad? Yeah, I th for for when we were working from home, from um, I think it was the end of March to the end of April, we were uh, we weren't in the office. Uh, so for about that month, Alec and I uh, were probably doing two or three a week, and our father was probably doing one or two a week. Um, so for that time, that's when it was, you know, as many as we could. Uh, Any time didn't matter, we would do it. Uh, just the ability to try and connect with people during that time was important. Um, and that's, that was the only opportunity we could. So uh, we were doing as many as we could for that month. Um, and then once we got back in the office, we slowed it down a little bit. Um, and then at this point, it's, it's one every so often. But uh, whoever asks or wants to do one, Alec and I are always happy to do it. Well, very good. And we appreciate you guys being here. Um, is this the first one? Have you done any in Europe yet, or is this your first one in Europe? Uh, we did New Zealand. First one in Europe, my friend. No, it's not in Europe. I was thinking <laughs> international. I'm thinking. <laughs> was that with uh, what's his name, Glenn? Yes, with uh, Grant. Yeah, Grant. Grant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's the only one in Europe. Um, we did, yeah, this is this is the only one. I believe. Oh, so this far. is the only one. I thought you said he was the only one. Sorry. No, 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 no. This is the only one so far. Terrible. Terrible. So when you do these pairings, do you do them with any other companies at all, or do you do it all fairly badly? Do you work with uh, Glenn Fiddick at all, or because I know you've got a very close relationship with Glenn Fiddick through Struan and your father. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, the pairings that we do are usually with Glenn Fiddick. Um, we also work with the, you know their sister company Balvenie at uh -huh. times, and uh, they they also own uh, Hudson Bourbon here in the state. So we work with those three mostly. Oh. Excuse me, sorry. So, what other projects are you working on that you can share with us? Because I guess next year is your is a twenty fifth anniversary. Is that right? Yes. If I've done my homework right. Yeah. So are you prepared to share with us any of your ideas or is it all top secret? It's pretty top secret at this point, uh, yeah. being that we're That's rubbish. That's rubbish. only, <laughs> we're, we're just working on blends at this point, um, trying to find the right blend uh, for the 25th anniversary. 
don't know what is if it's just going to be called 25th anniversary or if we'll come up with some other name for it. Um, you know, we always try and get creative, but for, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything more fitting than just putting Alec Bradley 20, 25th anniversary just to, you know, make it simple and uh, show everyone, you know, that it's that we've been doing this for a long time and we're we're ready to, to celebrate with a special cigar. So if you launch that, it'll be at the, um, I've got to get this right, PCA? Maybe summer May- the, the, on, the, on the roof of a hotel up into the space like the Monday Owl. Yeah, <laughs> that, we're, we're, we're not that far yet on even deciding when we're going to release it. We're still working on the blend and on the packaging. So uh, to have a release date in mind is, is kind of hard at this point. Yeah. Is there, a, is there a commemorative date of the year? No. We've talked about it and we were unsure yet. It's, it's definitely come up in conversation and we're not positive if we're going to attach it to a specific date or not. But um, at this point, we're just mostly focused on having the right cigar for the project. Okay. Other than that, I think that's the most secretive uh, project at this point. I mean, we're working on other stuff, but that's, that's definitely a big one. Hmm. No, that'll be good. I look forward to the, the 25th anniversary party in Vegas next summer. Oh yeah, don't you, don't you, Mitchell? Yeah. Sorry, just unmuting myself. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you, know, two, you know, two of us will be there. <laughs> looking forward yeah. to it. So I'm, I'm, I've been following the chat room. There's not been too many questions. So does that mean we're covering everything, or does it mean you're bored, or is anybody got any questions to ask? Because we're I'm getting to the end of my questions for these guys. So if you've got any questions, please um, shout now. Um, the kind of thing I'm, I want to ask is, you, you guys are still young in the industry, as am I. I've only been in the cigar industry for 10 years. So I'm still a, a newbie and learning every single day. So other than tonight, what's been the highest point, point of your career so far? <laughs> Right now, right here. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a tough question. Um, you know, one of the high points is is definitely getting Blind Faith rated number three by Cigar Journal. Um, that was caught us by surprise. Uh, I, I I almost wasn't paying so much attention because I didn't think that there was a chance in hell we would even make the list. Um, so that was a, a huge. Uh, high point for for me, I think Alec would agree on that. Yeah. And um, and then just the the launch of of each cigar is monumental. Um, you know, coming out with our first cigar. I mean, it's something that everyone remembers and you hold you know near and dear to your heart. And uh, and then Gatekeeper. So Blind Faith and Gatekeeper, the releases, I would say are are the most important thing to me. I agree and. Also adding to that, getting to work with Ernesto Perez Carrillo on the gatekeeper was definitely a high point, working with a legend within the industry and him being so willing to teach us and share his, you know, wealth of knowledge with us, which I'm sure he forgets more than we know at this point. But um, that was definitely a major highlight for me. And anytime that any of our cigars get rated, uh, on the Alec and Bradley line, that's that's huge for us. Just a cigar journal, a cigar aficionado, whoever it may be, um, to see that people are recognizing what we're doing is always an amazing feeling. And Bradley and I always watch to see what gets rated, but we, we never expect it to be us. We only have two cigars out. Uh, we haven't been manufacturers in terms of having our own line uh, for that long. So for people to try what we're doing and uh, appreciate it is always a very, you know, a very big deal to us. Oh, superb. So I've got, we're starting to get some questions coming in now. Uh, I've been prompted. Um, George, do you want to ask the, the gentleman your question? Where, where are you, George? Yep. Uh, boys, was it always cigars you were going to get into or did you have anything else you were going to do prior to actually just coming into your, the family business, essentially? For me, the only other thing that I ever considered getting into would be into the uh, liquor business. Um, I love whiskey. I, I love beer. And so that was always a passion of mine. 
but cigars outweighed both of those. And I just loved being here, the camaraderie within, within the industry and with our office and having the chance to work with my family every day. It just made perfect sense for me. Bradley, you're mm -hmm. muted. Thank you. Uh, for me, the only other thing I was possibly exploring was uh, something in sports, not actually playing sports because I'm not very athletic, but, uh, you know, sports marketing or, or something in that in that field just for my love of uh, just about all sports growing up and watching with uh, with my father. But uh, when it came time to graduate from university, uh, those cards weren't really on the table. And um, and then I had the the opportunity to work for a company that bears my name. And uh, like Alex said, I work with uh, my brother, my father, and my grandfather all at the same time. It, it was a, an opportunity I couldn't give up. Great question, George. We don't get asked that that often, for sure. Okay. So Anthony, John has a question for you. How are we doing, guys? You all right? Yeah, doing great, doing. Anthony. How are you? I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. It's uh, it's nice to uh, chat to you guys and kind of find out a little bit more background behind the uh, behind the brands. Really, obviously, from my standpoint, I do I do most of our taste test videos and the reviews. And the thing that I'm always kind of focusing on is the band design. Um, I've not I've not had the chance to smoke one yet, but I do really enjoy the Gatekeepers um, band design. So I just wanted to know who designed that and what was the thought process behind it. Mm -hmm. So that was. Uh, that was between me and our graphic designer. Yeah. Uh, you know, us just searching high and low for something that yeah. we thought would represent, you know, the name Gatekeeper well. And uh, Medusa's head being ripped off and being held uh, was just so out of left field and gothic and, and dark. And uh, we thought the imagery was was so cool that yeah. we didn't want to pass up on that opportunity. And uh, and it was a, almost a weird take on paying homage to Ernesto, someone who does very classic and elegant bands, um, but paying homage to him in a very dark uh, way. We thought it was uh, something different that, that not a lot of people have done. No, that's cool. That's awesome. Thank you ever so much. And um, the lineage was amazing, by the way. Uh, it was like, it's Thank one of those you. videos where I kind of was really focusing on it as well. Uh -huh. um, and I watched it back and I was like, yeah, no, I'm going to have to pick up a couple of those and uh, get them for my own humidor. So that's, uh, that's cool. Appreciate your time, guys. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> one, one cool thing is that a lot of people probably don't realize is Bradley actually heads up the concepting and artwork for all the Alec and Bradley projects. Wow. I have a little bit of say, but Bradley, um, he really has a creative vision when it comes to it. And I try to stay out of his way as much as possible, but that's not always possible. <laughs> and we tend to, uh, you know, bicker and go at it a little bit. But with that, I also get to focus uh, more on the blending side. And um, he kind of tells me his vision for the project. And then I kind of go out there and try to find the cigar. And we try to, you know, collaborate together to get where, exactly where we want to be. Mm -hmm. And being brothers, that's never easy. And I don't, <laughs> no. I don't suspect it will ever get any easier. But, um, <laughs> but it's, a, it's a fun process and letting us kind of both focus because um, we're both passionate about, bo about both aspects of it. But um, kind of divide, uh, dividing the responsibilities allows us to get things done quicker. And if we didn't, we'd probably never have a cigar out. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's cool. That's awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. Thanks, Andrew. So we have a question from Karen. Karen, where are you? Hi. Uh, we just wanted to know, do you see many female smokers? Because um, we don't. <laughs> um, and a bit of an entity, really. Well, what's pretty cool is we are seeing a lot more female smokers, especially in the States lately. Um, I walk into cigar stores all the time at this point, and there's always... Um, women smoking within the stores and I've actually been seeing that number grow over the last few years which has been absolutely amazing um, Bradley do you have a different take on that or no I, I agree with you I, I see a lot of uh, a lot of women smoking cigars online uh, obviously we can't go into stores now uh, many places so I see it <clears throat> on Facebook and on Instagram all the time my girlfriend uh, is a cigar smoker and I met her at a, at a shop that she was working at um, so I, I think we're seeing more and more uh, female cigar smokers and I think it's growing a lot. 
I think a lot of people tend to think that women like to smoke flavored cigars. And uh, I know for a fact that that is not not true because I see a lot of women smoking a lot stronger cigars than men are smoking half the time. So uh, you do see a lot more women cigar smokers out there and you see uh, the groups on social media of all these women cigar smokers. So it's definitely a growing segment within our industry. Great question. Sorry, do you see women having a different palate or is it pretty much the same? Uh, no, I see women having a more refined palate actually and they're able to pull a lot more flavor notes. And I think it's just because um, women are more in tune with their palates and have more sensitive palates. So it's just, it's just part of it. Even when down at the factories, when it comes to sorting the tobaccos, women just have a more sensitive touch and are able to pick up on that a lot easier than men are. Okay. Right, thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks for the question. Tom had asked a question about range extensions and, um, I'll answer that and say we're in discussions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're... That's, the, that's the best way to describe it. We're in discussions. Every yeah. year we always try to bring something new in from Alec Bradley, but because of the registration process and all the other stuff that we have to go through these days, it's a bit more complicated as an importer than it used to be five years ago when we could say, you know what, just add some of these, add some of these. And it just doesn't work like that, sadly, now. There's... Um, costs and processes involved now with public health England and places people like that that make it a bit more complicated so there's an ongoing discussion just now between ourselves to work out what the next uh, Ali brand Bradley brand will be and uh, you will all know about it as soon as we make that final decision so um, unless there's um, any more questions I think we'll, we'll we very much say thank you to the gentleman tonight for their time Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. Scott, Mitchell, mm -hmm. Alan, we, we really appreciate it. Cool. Yeah. You can tell your dad to come out the cupboard now. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But please send our best wishes on to your father, to Ralph, mm -hmm. uh, and the rest of the guys. Um, thank you very much indeed for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed. Absolutely. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. We, we really appreciate all the support, always. And Paul, I didn't, I didn't forget you. I just didn't see you there. So, and uh, Alec Bradley, much appreciated. Uh, really, really enjoy uh, yeah, t touching base with uh, people such as yourselves. So, thanks for your time, uh, Scott. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, thank you very much, yeah, guys. You, I'll see you all in a couple of weeks' time, I believe, and uh, we'll speak to you soon, uh, gentlemen. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you so Thanks much, everyone. Thank you for everyone. joining us. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Good night, guys. Have a good one. Take care, Bye. guys. Have a nice evening. See you later. You as well.